some of the leading uh, up-and-coming experts on Russia. Uh, you sometimes hear in the media a narrative that, well, uh, the system isn't producing anymore any good experts on, on Russia. Um, where are they? Well, we actually think there are quite a number of them that are doing really outstanding work, um, you know, reflecting deep knowledge, um, you know, brilliant theoretical insights. And I'm very happy to say that uh, Jean-Francois Rattel, or, or Jeff, as we call him, uh, is uh, exemplary of, of this uh, category of, of person, someone who's a, a true expert on this topic. He'll today be talking about assessing the terrorist threat in Russia after the Islamic State. Um, and I should just say also that he's a director of the Center uh, on Governance at the University of Ottawa, and also a uh, lecturer in conflict studies and, and human rights there at its uh, Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. And uh, he was also a, uh, a visiting scholar here, fellow here for, um, I forget exactly, two years, um, you know, several years ago. I can't, yeah, 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 yeah. it seems like very almost yesterday, but uh, time flies. <laughs> So uh, please uh, join me and uh, join me in welcoming Jeff back and uh, look forward to his talking. So thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you to Ponars and Aris to have me here. Uh, today I'll, and thank you to Henry and Marlene to, for inviting me. Today I'll be assessing the terrorist threat in Russia, trying to move from the general topic we used to look at, the North Caucasus insurgency, connecting them with the idea of foreign fighters and what is going on across Russia in terms of terrorist networks, how does it connect with the Islamic State, and more precisely, what will happen now that many seasoned fighters that travel from Russia to Syria and Iraq are slowly coming back. Uh, we are seeing them uh, in Ukraine, in Georgia, um, in Turkey. So I'll try to connect all three elements to demonstrate that the threat has evolved in a more uh, nationwide perspective, much more diffuse, and the threat of violence is slowly changing and adapting new forms in Russia. So I'll start by looking at the North Caucasus insurgency. I'll explain quickly how since 2012, the insurgency has been slowly going down, most likely because the fighters or support for the insurgency left to Syria and Iraq, but at the same time because Russia was very efficient at fighting a counter-terrorist, counter-insurgency program around the Sochi Olympics. I'll discuss quickly also about what to expect in the coming years. Is Russia finally done with the insurgency? Are we seeing it? Uh, renewal in Chechnya and Ingushetia in the re recent months. Second thing, uh, look most likely in the terrorist network that are inspired by the Islamic State but are not connected to in the insurgency, the North Caucasus insurgency across Russia. What we're seeing, not to steal the punch, is that most likely it is starting to move away from the North Caucasus, away from the North Caucasus insurgency, and mainly driven by Central Asian migrants rather than North Caucasian, most likely the Gestanis and Chechens. Finally, I'll address what everybody is worried about, the idea of returning foreign fighters. We'll look slowly at, are they coming back? What are their main objectives? What are their main strategies? And whether or not we should be worried for Russia, because Russia is by far, one, not by far, but one of the biggest contingent of foreign fighters, not including Central Asian countries. Um, they have been involved in many parts of the Syrian insurgency in the civil war. So there is worry that as the Islamic State is collapsing, these fighters will need to go somewhere. These fighters are already starting to move away from Syria. The question is, is Russia really controlling their border? Are the fighters really interested to enter the Russian ter territory? So how do I approach the topic? I've been studying the North Caucasus, most likely Dagestan, Chechen, Kabardino, Bulgaria for now roughly seven or eight years. My first field work in Russia uh, was conducted in 2009. At first the idea was trying to understand why in the very many Salafis that we had in Dagestan and Chechnya, only a small minority were engaging into the insurgency. In other words, if we turn the question around, although the insurgency was religious, Islamist, Salafist, put the label you want, the majority of them refused really to engage into the insurgency, even if they were repressed 
by security forces in Ingushetia, in Kabarnia, Bulgaria, and in Dagestan and Chechnya. This research is, was conducted most likely in 2012, and the question, as I said, was the dilemma between fighting the, in the insurgency or saying, oh, the problem starting with the establishment of the Islamic State, the problem with um, 2013 to 2015 is the question changed suddenly. We saw a massive wave of Salafis deciding to travel abroad and go and fight with the Islamic State. The question about the fieldwork I connected, uh, conducted in 2016 was, what is the difference between fighting jihad at home and fighting it abroad? Because the Salafis, as I will say, decided not to fight for the majority around the 2009 to 2011. Later on, the majority of them decided to move to Syria and Iraq. Then suddenly, as the Islamic State is collapsing, the question is, these same Salafis that cho have chosen to fight or to travel to Syria, are they willing to come back finally to Russia in order to fight the Russian state? Are their priorities something more religious or something more connected to the Russian state? So the question is framed as choices that appear on the radar of religious individuals, whether to fight or not, to fight at home or abroad, or coming back to fight, or sustaining other projects abroad. In order to give some kind of context with all that, it is important to understand what happened to the North Caucasus insurgency. As you'll see in the graph, starting in 2011, 2012, as I was describing, we, you, we see a collapse of the insurgency. Most likely, if we look at the statistic, you see the peak of the insurgency in 2011, 2012, the moment where we were discussing about conducting interviews with the fighters at home, whether they want to fight or not. And suddenly, with the counter-terrorist operation in Chechnya, the counter-terrorist operation in Dagestan and Kabardino-Balkaria connected to the Sochi Olympic, as well as the outflow of fighters <coughs> in Syria, you see a sudden decrease in insurgent activity. In fact, if you look in the various republics in Kabardino-Balkaria, there's last year almost no insurgent activity. The question now is, is there something left of the North Caucasus insurgent? The answer is not much. The entire network has been eradicated, the leadership has been killed or is currently abroad, and the leadership that were still willing to fight most likely tried to come back to the North Caucasus or reach Syria to act as a safe haven. So, looking at that, it brings you, it brings me to the discussion with insurgents. In 29-2012, at the peak of the insurgency, the question was this, what insurgents say about their participation? What Salafi says about their non-participation? What we're looking to when I conducted interviews here, for two years roughly, I conduct interviews with families of fighters, with fighter connected to the Marat Kafkaz, with security services in Dagestan, in kabardino balkaria including FSB and police forces. What comes back again and again is the majority of the fighters were telling me in discussion or their families they most likely fight about their negative experience with security forces. Being religiously profiled, being humiliated because of their faith, because of what happened with negative experience with the security forces. But at the same time, the majority of the Salafis in Dagestan mountains, in Mahashkala, and somewhere else in the North Caucasus, the same answer was always the same among very religious people. It's not the time and it's not the reason we want to fight. Even if we have a religious insurgency, it is not what we perceive as our duty to fight here in the North Caucasus. The mo although the numbers, when you look at them, seem pretty high in terms of 800 casualties, 1,000 casualties a year, it remains a very limited insurgency. And it brings the puzzle that we can ask why Salafis are not really willing to engage into fighting the Russian state in the North Caucasus. Why the majority of people are fighting in the name of taking revenge, taking revenge about what they perceive was done against them, rather than about the religious duty. 
At the same time, as I said, the entire structure of the insurgency was destroyed between 2013 and 2015. So you have two different processes here. Whether you wanted to join the insurgency and you realize there more and more there was infiltration, that the structure was collapsing, there was not many opportunities. So you have a double movement here. One, you will have the Islamic State calling for new recruits coming to the caliphate, coming to the idea of the utopia. At the same time, at home, the insurgency is collapsing. So those two factors will push a lot of individuals to decide to make Ijra, go to the Islamic State, because they didn't really have other option. At that time, in terms of the insurgency, we were thinking about the terrorist threat. As the North Caucasus insurgency has collapsed, the, the network that used to be developed from the North Caucasus toward Moscow are most likely non-existent. So the, what connected the North Caucasus to terrorist network connected with the Domodedovo airport attack or the Moscow metro attack in 2010, all those networks has been most likely crushed. So when we're thinking about the terrorist network, and the danger of potential terrorists for the FIFA or for certain activities in Russia, we have to start thinking, looking at ISIS-inspired network as well as foreign fighters. This is where, by giving this context, I want to explain where we are and why we focus so much on foreign fighters. So, In 2013, 2014, and I can show the graph here, usually it's a good way to explain it. When you look at the amount of people that left Russia to fight in Syria and Iraq, you see an, an exponential wave of fighters leaving most likely with the declaration of the caliphate in, the, in Syria and Iraq, until Russia most likely starts closing their borders as well as Turkey. So we can see most likely two waves of people leaving for Syria. There was people connected with the insurgency that was most likely abroad, and suddenly a wave of young Salafists. The young Salafists I was discussing about people that were telling me we were not willing to try, we were not willing to fight, we we're not willing to engage in the insurgency. Suddenly those people believe that the call for Ijra, the call for the Islamic State was more worthy than fighting for the insurgency in the North Caucasus. So, based on, based on Fielder Cotton in 2016, the question about what I call the foreign terrorist fighters puzzle. Why those people, especially in Dagestan, in Chechnya, but all across Russia, suddenly believe that fighting in Syria and Iraq as a higher value, a bigger value compared to what we have seen pre previously. So one of the big success of the Islamic State was to be able to clearly bring the mobilization all across Russia, in far north, in the communities of migrant workers, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in Tatarstan, in Bashkortostan, not only the North Caucasus and the surrounding region of the North Caucasus. At the same time, it is important to remind that the vast majority of the fighters are coming from the North Caucasus. When we're talking about roughly 4,000 people who left Russia, 35 to 40% are coming from Dagestan and Chechnya. But in interviews, in interviews made with families of fighters, with fighters themselves that uh, we found, I found in Dagestan, the same explanations come back. When you ask the fighters and the relative, why are you leaving for Syria, there's two major narratives that come on. Ijra, most likely as a solution for what they perceive in Russia. Because they perceive they were discriminated against, because they perceive about some level of marginalization, they perceive that the Islamic State offered them more. Not always the, the idea to fight. And this is how it connects to the previous interview I had. Many of the Salafi didn't perceive the Islamic State as a first duty of fighting or engaging into a complete insurgency. They were families, they were individuals that were most likely 
often apolitical in Dagestan and Chechnya, but perceive that the Islamic State offer more than what they have in Russia. They also a lot bring the idea of the utopia of the caliphate. A lot of the Salafi in 2010, 2011 were saying, I don't perceive that we'll get an Islamic State. I don't perceive that we'll get anything very soon. The only way I can be more religious is by myself, by my community, not by fighting into the insurgency of the North Caucasus. This will bring nothing to us. But suddenly, the Caliphate, whether it is true or not, offers all kinds of new opportunities for them. So many people, in between the choice of being repressed at home, not having access to the type of mosque that they wanted, not being able to practice their faith as they wanted, slowly turned to our Israel. And this is why I'm saying when we look at the two waves of foreign fighters, at the beginning you have this first wave, most likely connected to a few individuals that were interested by fighting Bashar al-Assad, fighting the Syrian regime. But it was not yet a quest of about a religious duty. But the call from the Islamic State that appears somewhere here launched this idea. At the same time, at that period, Russia in 2013, 2014, was trying to secure the North Caucasus for the Sochi Olympics. Around that period, we think that between three to 10,000 people left, most likely the North Caucasus, but other region, as economic migrants toward Turkey, religious migrants, not only as fighters for the Islamic State. So you have a massive wave of individuals connected to Muslim societies in Russia that move to Turkey, that move to Syria, to move to Iraq. This will create a form of society, a form where at the end of the Islamic State, in the period we are now, all these people are broadly connected all together because repression coming from the Turkish state against ISIS networks suddenly also repress people that are in migrant communities as in Istanbul, Dagestanis, Chechens, uh, Tatars, and others. So we are in a period where even if we focus mainly on foreign fighters from Russia, the idea is that the movement is much broader than that. Rather than staying at home, those people have believed that they have more opportunities economically wise or religiously wise abroad. The question that comes, first, after three, four, five years of fighting with the Islamic State or independent Jamaat in Syria, will those people come back to Russia? If you're thinking about 4,000 fighters from Russia, 5,000 from Central Asia, first, are they willing to come back to Russia? And second, if they come back to Russia, are they willing to engage into the insurgents? What do we have in terms of numbers? First of all, on those 4,000 fighters, including most likely 300 children, maybe uh, roughly eight, seven to 800 women, we have so far about 400 cases of returnees. Those returnees can be women, can be children, most likely driven by the Kedirov program of bringing back children. It gives us so far of a 10% return rate, approximately. It is still much lower than what we see in Belgium, in France, in UK, even in Canada. This this return rate is extremely low, and we can explain how, because Russia has been extremely repressive against people coming back. The prosecution against them are being difficult. A lot of people have chosen to go somewhere else to avoid prosecution. I'll come back about that. The second question we have, among those returnees, are those people coming back from the Islamic State because they didn't want to fight? They were tired, they were not happy with the Islamic State, or are they people that try to smuggle in in order to engage in the insurgency? Pessimistic person like me are saying 4,000 people. This contingent is much bigger than what we have seen in Bosnia, what we have seen in Somalia, in Iraq in the first period. It's similar in terms of contingent to what we have seen from Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan in the 1980s. It's something extremely worrisome in terms of security. <coughs> So far, what we have been identifying is roughly 20 cases of returnees involved in the insurgency and or plotting terrorist attack against Russia. In other words, 
5% of the returnees are involved in violent activities when they are coming back. This is a rate that is roughly what is still at the low level. What can we say about returnees? Most likely people that return are women, children, people that were not ready to fight. Seasoned fighters, veterans of the jihad with the Islamic State and with independent Jamaat in Syria still didn't come back. So what I'm trying to say here is when we try to assess the effect of returnee for foreign fighters from a foreign jihad, we usually have to look at a period between 10 to 30 years. If you think about the Afghan Arabs of Afghanistan about the, at the end of the 1980s, they moved to different countries, to different jihad from Algeria, Bosnia, Chechnya, Tajikistan, Egypt, and so on. To this day, al Zawari is one example of a foreign fighter that continue to circulate in between jihads, mainly in Pakistan now. But in between the end of the conflict in Afghanistan in 1889 and the creation of Al-Qaeda, you see that the network most likely survived for 30 years, producing fighters like Al-Zarqawi, Bin Laden, and others. The problem is when we're thinking about returnees, we think that, oh, we avoid the problem now. We avoid the wave. Nothing happened badly. But the problem is that we are so narrow-minded that we're looking so, we focus so much on a little period right now that we're missing the entire forest. Yes, the tree is fine, but the forest is still worrisome. If you compare the network in Chechnya, following the first Chechen war, Chechen training camps have produced insurgent networks from Dagestan, kabardino balkaria no guys, karachevo Cherkessia, as well as in Moscow and so on. Those networks are still active. Muslim al-Shishani in Syria is a, pro, uh, a former fighter that trained in, this, in the Chechen training camp and moved to Syria. Those fighters back in the Syrian York camp were the ones that expand the network of the insurgency in Dagestan, in Kabarni Volkari, and in Gushevia, and destabilized the entire North Caucasus for more than 20 years. The question here is that returning foreign fighters have, for a long period of time, the ability to change ideologies, like foreign fighters did in Chechnya, bring new technologies like suicide bombings, and bring their experience to jumpstart an insurgency. Everything that the North Caucasus insurgency needs. Second thing, usually what we have learned with Saudi Arabia, what we have learned with other countries that have exported their foreign fighters, is that if you don't have a system to reintegrate them, offer them rehabilitation, those people are stuck into a militant career. Meaning, even if I want to come back, if I know that my country will throw me in jail, kill me, or do something worse even, the only option that I have is to continue to be an insurgent, continue to be a militant, whether into a criminal career or whether as an insurgent career. In that current situation, Russia offers rehabilitation program to women, to children, but men will be sent to prison for more than 15 years, if they are lucky. Many of them so far have disappeared in the system, being tortured, we didn't hear back from a lot of those returnees. So the question is, if you're a Russian foreign fighter, would you come back to Russia? So the second question is, where are they going if they don't want to come back? What we have seen so far, the majority of the fighters are in transit right now. They have moved away from the Islamic State. They are being smuggled through the Turkish border, most likely with Russian-speaking network. Most of them have been hiding in Turkey in 2015, 2016. But after the attack at the Istanbul airport, after the attack at the nightclub around the New Year a few years ago in 2016, then fighters have been moving slowly away. Two main places where they have moved away, Georgia and Ukraine. The most important one is Ukraine. We've seen a growing network of former ISIS fighters moving to Ukraine. So we're talking about hundreds of fighters of ISIS around Lvov, Odessa, Kiev, and others. That creates a huge problem. And 
I will put it in terms of examples so we understand. Roughly 50 to 70 Afghan Arabs moved from Afghanistan in the 1980s to Chechnya and completely changed the insurgency, made them more professional, made them more dangerous, made them much more radical in terms of their interpretation of jihad, hatab, and other completely changed the wave of fighters. A young generation turned to takfirism, to suicide bombings, and so on. 70, 50 to 70. We're talking to hundreds of fighters right now in Ukraine that are hiding somewhere in Ukraine. You want another example? The Bankisi Gorge of 2002, 2003. We have described in Georgia the Bankisi Gorge as one of the biggest up of terrorism in Eurasia for a couple of years. We were talking about a couple hundred of fighters connected to the international jihad, including Ozar Kawi and others. Again, Suddenly, Ukraine has on its territory several hundred fighters, seasoned fighters that are not willing to come back to Russia because of the fear of what can happen to them. At the same time, Turkey is deporting more and more fighters from Turkey, from Istanbul toward Ukraine. Because fighters, when they are fighters or migrants from the North Caucasus, offer two choices. You can be deported to Ukraine because they have a visa-free regime with Russia, or you can be deported to Russia and don't know what will happen to you. So the, the choice is extremely easy. Most of the fighters are saying, maybe it's not a religious country in terms of Islam, but at least it's a sanctuary where we can rest, think, and decide what will be the next step. At the same time, we've seen in November that in Georgia, several fighters from the Islamic State has moved to Georgia and started organizing a small cells that led to 10 to 15 insurgents in the region. We also see Central Asia moving to Afghanistan and Egypt. It's bringing us to the question about terrorist threat in Russia. On the short term, the biggest problem with, for Russia is the terrorist network inspired by the Islamic State. In the last year, we've seen 40 to 50 plots that were most likely connected to IS ideology without being connected to the insurgency in the region, meaning that online radicalization, online activities as most likely be driving Central Asian communities to engage in low-level sophistication attack. We're talking about attack with knives. We're talking attack with axes. We're talking sometime with a gunfight. But at the same time, Russia has been cracking down on a lot of Central Asian migrants communities, claiming that we arrested 10, 15 insurgents or people connected to the Islamic State. There is a threat that is coming from this, what we can call homegrown terrorism. Russia did not face homegrown terrorism compared to the US, Canada, Western Europe in the last couple of years. Most of the plot were connected to the insurgency. But as I said, the insurgency right now is completely destroyed. It is being depleted. It's not able to organize proper terrorist network. So what we're seeing is small bunch of fighters, leaderless network popping up everywhere in Russia. What is worrisome is suddenly it is covering the entire Russian territory from the east to the north, to the North Caucasus as we're expecting, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in um, in the Volga, and so on. So slowly we've seen an expansion of at least the idea of the Islamic State. At the same time, the problem is we always compare and contrast whether ISIS ideology is homegrown or the returnees. But on the long term, on those 15 or 10 years, you have at least a thousand fighters that will be moving that cannot go back to Russia, that are not welcome anywhere in the region, that will move jihad to jihad in order to survive. This is a long-term risk for Russia in the sense that they are slowly coming back around the Russian border. In Ukraine, as I said, in Georgia, we expect to see a few of them in Azerbaijan because of the network with the Dagestani smuggling network. In Afghanistan, so the, the worry that we can have for Russia is that on a 10, 15 year period, seasoned veterans will be building networks of insurgency all across 
the Russian border. You need only a couple of dozen of fighters to enter and organize around local radical in order to completely change the insurgency. I give here one last example so you understand what Russia is facing in terms of risk right now. Think about the French and the Belgian network of foreign fighters connected to the Bataclan and other attack in Belgium. Most likely, this, these networks were established around local fighters, around local recruits that were connected ideologically, inspired by ISIS. Only a couple of returning foreign fighters with military skills come and organize an entire structure, an entire structure where they can find weapons, when they can organize a small attack, where they can use explosives. So this is the logic in which we should understand terrorist threat in Russia. Yet there is a growing support for ISIS ideology. At the same time, ISIS ideology is not about the caliphate anymore. A lot of people went over there because they believed that ISIS was different. The majority of those Salafi that were interested by ISIS were not interested to fight in Russia, but they were interested in a broader religious idea. At the same time, if you have a couple dozen individuals that strongly believe that homegrown terrorism makes sense, but they don't know how to do something, those fighters here, in dozens coming back to Russia, smuggling in, can really change the way we perceive terrorism. Last sentence that I'll say. I, doesn't mean that I expect a rise in terrorist activities for the FIFA this summer or for uh, in the short future. Why, if you come back to the Sochi Olympics, many of us, including me, were saying, look at the North Caucasus insurgency, they are coming, they will be hitting art Sochi or around Sochi. But at the same time, Russia was able to clearly manage the threat, eliminate the leaders, push Salafis and others that were supporting the insurgency outside and protect the venue back in 2014. So the same thing can apply here. I don't predict a big increase of terrorist attack, but at the same time, all countries that have exported their foreign fighters abroad all came back with major problem in history. Whether you're thinking about the communist networks of the 1930s, whether you're talking about the Afghan Arabs of the 1980s, or are you talking about the Chechens and their network of the 1990s? Every case from Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and others, all of them has face a backlash problem. So in that case, I don't see Russia being in a better position in the future. Yes, exporting their problem probably helped to stabilize the North Caucasus and the country in general. At the same time, the threat is only going to be worse abroad on Russian embassies as much death at home. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Very interesting talk. So um, I think we should go ahead and open it up for questions and discussions from the uh, audience. Yes. yes. And if you just identify yourself, Yeah, please, Marlena, yeah. RNGW. Yep, it was wonderful. I have a, a question about numbers and yep. statistics. When you say 400 are returnees, so it's like 10% yep. rate. Is a percentage made on the 4,000 who left, but how many survived? Because the point is that if 2,000 are dead and 2,000 survived, then the rate of returnees is already 20%. I mean, yes. just, just to bring the, the number of people dead on the, on the ground there. Back. If I can find those. The, the rate is based on how many fighters or extremist travelers left. So mm -hmm. if, in order to compare with other jihad fronts in the past, we usually compare with the, the entire contingent. Okay. But I agree that here there's a problem because in the past, contingents survive more. Yeah. But at the same time, there's a big reason to believe that the 4,000 is way under what we're expecting. So in that logic, 
I think 10% represent a lower amount compared to France, Belgium, and UK. In fact, returnees have been much lower for Russia compared to Western Europe. Um, so we can expect in the future that those fighters are somewhere in the system. We didn't, although the killing rate was higher than we were expecting, uh, we didn't see as many corpses or a, as many proof that many of them died around Raqqa or the region. So in terms of percentage, we're talking about the contingent, but we're still much lower than any other uh, contingent <coughs> from other countries. So there's a reason to think that Georgia, Turkey, and Ukraine has a big amount of those fighters. And we know that some of them are still active in Idlib, in Afrin, and other regions. So they continue to fight because there's an opportunity, but we are slowly entering into the, the process of seeing them coming back. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes please. Marjorie Madison Balls or Georgetown. Um, you mentioned sanctuaries around Russia. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more what you know of whether there are particular pockets already forming, what do we know about networks inside of Russia, outside of the North Caucasus? We've seen a few returnees organizing, and I know you said the outside of North Caucasus, but I can mention there's a network that some of the early returnees organized in central Dagestan, southern Dagestan, sure. uh, in Ingushetia recently. We have seen network in Moscow. We have seen potential network at the border between Ukraine and Russia. Strong network in Odessa and Lvov uh, that we, a lot of us have tracked. Uh, and uh, in, in Georgia in general. From Azerbaijan, from what I heard from a few people conducting research there, we didn't see network growing as much over there. And indirectly, we've seen network also uh, in the Balkans. So the question is also to ask, people that are in the Balkans, whether in Kosovo, in Bosnia, or in Ukraine, is their objective going back to Russia or their objective going back to uh, Western Europe? because there's a lot of North Caucasus community in which fighters have access to passport, have the ability to re-enter into the EU. The EU always said that it was not a problem because of biometrics, because of information on Interpol, but it's not something that we should avoid thinking, because a lot of the first wave of combatants that left, um, that left refugee community in Austria, in France, in Belgium, from the North Caucasus, at EU passport. Those EU passport enter the system with the Islamic State, but we don't know what happened to them. Second thing, it's not impossible to believe that some of those fighters will try to smuggle in in the wave of refugees, or even economic migrants by the border with Poland on, or Hungary. So that's also something we should think we have to try to understand, after resting, after rebuilding the network, what is the priority? Fight, uh, fighting the far enemy, Western Europe, based on the Al-Suri doctrine, or striking in Russia, building network to f target what is seen now as the most important far enemy compared to Western Europe, Russia and their role in Syria. In, Personally, I believe that the next step is toward Russia, but in order to enter Russia and rebuild, you need to wait for the best opportunity. That opportunity might not come in a fight in the next couple of months. This opportunity might only be coming in one or two years. Uh, during that time, a lot will be how the sanctuary itself deal with their problem. For example, in Georgia, um, in 2002, 2003, they were very lenient in targeting or striking the foreign fighters or the terrorists that were in the Bankitsi Gorge. This helped the network to stabilize, to be stronger. The question, what will Ukraine do? If Ukraine decide to openly target and try to eliminate this network, then they are suddenly fighting a counter-terrorist operation inside their own territory, a counter-terrorist operation they don't want to fight, that they will take resources. So what we can see is, based on the decision on Ukraine, it will more or less force foreign fighters to make a decision what to do with the sanctuaries. But something that we've seen, and we're 100% sure, we already see 
uh, former ISIS fighters and former independent Jamaat fighters meddling with criminal organization as well as a soft battalion and other inside of Ukraine. That means access to weapons, access to criminal enterprise, access to fake passport, access to smuggling routes. So there's a big worry that this problem can be exported as much to the east than to the west. Maybe if I could just follow up briefly on that. So, um, if I interpret correctly, you, you don't see uh, you know these cells or you know, these these burgeoning networks in places like Georgia and Ukraine as real threats to Ukraine and Georgia itself, as far as as far as terrorist acts themselves, right? So you, you you don't expect them to be targeting the local kind of sanctuary countries. It's more you know the harm they would be doing would be more sort of collaborating with organized crime and. You know, weakening rule of law and, and trafficking arms and, and this sort of thing. You know, or do you think that the you know, say the Ukrainian populations around uh, Odessa and the are themselves, you know, really under threat of terrorist acts by these groups? There will be a collateral damage for any sanctuaries that keep their foreign fighters or terrorists long enough. The example of Afghanistan, the example of Pakistan, the example of Somalia, Mali, all example where you keep them for too long, it's a little bit like a cancer. At some point, even if the organ is very healthy, at some point the organ, the organ will collapse. So at some point when the EU will tell Ukraine, okay, you have now a contingent of 500 Foreign fighters I think in Lvov and Kiev and all that, you need to do something based on your uh, duty about the recent uh, Security Council decisions. At that point, Ukraine is suddenly forced to act by itself against a beast that has been building its network strong, stronger and stronger for a while. So in the long term, Ukraine, Georgia will have a negative effect about that, but they don't represent the target that the militant wants. Mm -hmm. The militants are thinking about the career, the movement, and everything. But depending on how Ukraine will react, Ukraine will have a negative effects on the short term or the mid term. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Panek uh, Vetorka, American University and uh, Broadcasting Board of Governors. What's the role of the internet? How fighters, uh, insurgents uh, communicate? Uh, how they recruit each other? Uh, in Internet played a, an amazing role, a very important role to call people to the caliphate. It was extremely important because it was advertising something different. It was advertising uh, something that need to be consumed, something that was different, something that answered the grievances of many of those local jihadists as much as Salafists and religious Islamists. Now, internet is not playing the same role. The propaganda is there, but what it has to offer is not as attractive. It's not the caliphate, it's not the utopia, it is on ground terrorism, it is something much more difficult to fight the FSB right in front where they are the most efficient. So, I think we have overestimated the effect of internet versus the effect of the utopia itself. The strong part of the caliphate was its image. The way it was marketed, the way uh, it was used on social media was very useful. But at the same time, if we compare the mobilization for the Islamic State versus the mobilization for homegrown terrorism, as I was saying, we have 47 cases or 50 now cases of homegrown terrorism, including St. Petersburg and including Sergut, important one. But at the same time, it's very minimal versus a wave of 10,000 Russian-speaking individuals leaving. So we need, when we look at online propaganda, think that targeting grievances, targeting an utopia is not targeting violent engagement. And when we don't understand this difference, if we trying to put everything together, saying, look, they mobilized 10,000, they will be able to do it ne next week. No, we, what we're seeing is that in order to mobilize local insurgents, you need a structure. You need weapons, you need a network, you need ideology that is giving face to face. You need to trust the person where you'll take explosives. You need to believe that the person is not from FSB, is not from an intelligence network. So internet is important because Telegram and other offers ways to connect people differently. It offers new opportunities to 
plot attacks, but at the same time, it's not this revolution in terms of dealing with an insurgency. It was a revolution for the Islamic State. It was the revolution to sell a dream, but certainly not to engage into an insurgency. Okay, uh, yes, in the third row in the middle, please. Hi, uh, Odola Percy, SIS. Um, to what extent um, are the Russian-speaking uh, folks, not just the Russians, but also those from Central Asia, the, the, the ones who went directly from Central Asia, do they form a coherent ideological whole? I mean, one of the things that was striking about them in Syria was that they tended to fight together and stick together um, and not integrate into a broader um, basis or whoever else group. Mm -hmm. So is that, are those divides things? I think that speaks a little bit to what happens, where do they go, what happens when they go there, do they, you know, do they become part of a um, broader insurgency against Europe, or do they focus mm -hmm. on Russia? I think, I agree with you in a sense that the Russian speaking stick together, but at the same time, the Russian speaking are extremely fragmented among the Russian speaking. That's so they need their, they appreciate the culture, they appreciate the fact that they can communicate, that they see world, the world the, the same way. But we see important cleavage, let's say, between all Emirati and all uh, the new Takfiri or, so I think what, what, I do believe they will move into small groups of Russian speaking one, where they will recruit around people that might not be fully Russian speaking or connected to them. But at the same time, I believe that the most religious one or the most takfiri one might go toward Afghanistan or Egypt. The one that are more connected to the older network, the nationalist network, the Emirati, will move to Ukraine because the network is strong already and they have fighter there. They will, they will be, there will be cross-fertilization between ethnicity, as we have seen in the past, but at the same time, they are surprisingly obsessed by their ethnicity, even if they are looking for this pan-Islamic ideology. Um, Chechens still stick with Chechens, sometimes with the kids. Dagestanis always complain that Chechens are different, that they don't do the things the same way, they don't cook the same way. Uh, Central Asians and North Caucasians connect sometimes, but it was one of the biggest challenge of the North Caucasus insurgency, how to welcome those Central Asian are they the same as we are? And Hatab said uh, in the 19, uh, 1990s, the ones that are coming are most likely spies. We don't want them. We can duck. We have nobody in the kinship network or in the clans to vouch for them. So the level of trust, even with the Kazakh that came later in the insurgency 2010, 2011, it was extremely difficult to get Central Asian to really integrate the North Caucasus insurgency. And it, it was even difficult to connect with the Volga region. Umarov was always saying, oh, we're coming to the Volga region, but at the same time, we bring in our brand, take it, and we'll send our fighter there. We don't really want to radicalize people there. So I would not see a wave of fighters moving together. It's not each other where everybody follow the same pipeline. I think the pipeline was most likely connected to previous experiences. So people that, uh, students in Egypt, uh, people that were in the Middle East, will most likely be more easily to go into our Egypt. People that had family or connection in Ukraine already are moving there. So we can see there's a certain logic. It's not surprising, let's say, that Ahmed Shatayev moved our Georgia rather than Ukraine. It's not surprising that he's moving away from the EU a little bit. So there's a logic. I would say there's, um, there's a, all the habits die hard. So what you know as a network, what confers you, especially because the Istanbul network has disappeared. This is where they connect all of them, where they feel comfortable in Kandair and other network were there. Uh, this network has been crushed with the recent Turkish operation or special operation. They need to rebuild that comfort that they had before with the Merat Kafka. When you get injured in the North Caucasus, you get out in Georgia, you move slowly, you go to Istanbul, you go up to the beach, and then you can go back to the Pangi Sea or through the mountains in Dagestan. This comfort food and this comfort zone doesn't exist, and I believe that they will try to rebuild the same thing in Ukraine, but then the next step will be, do we have a way to connect Ukraine toward Russia? Because we have seen one or two individuals trying to cross around Kursk, and has not been that successful. So until they find the smuggling routes, 
I don't think we'll see this big wave of coming people mm -hmm. moving together. We'll see a little bunch of people going across the region, including Afghanistan. And connecting with that, Central Asian feel much more comfortable in Afghanistan. They have their networks. And it's not surprising why we don't see many of them going to Ukraine or even Georgia. The big question we have is what about Azerbaijan? They connected in the Islamic State, they connected in Western Aleppo, they connected in Syria, and we, we didn't hear anyone going over there. When you hear field work done in Azerbaijan, a lot of people believe that Northern Azerbaijan is a perfect region, that the networks are there, the lesbians are ready to move people in, that the smuggling network, uh, friends that already smuggle all kind, kind of things at the border. So I would not be surprised that Azerbaijan appears as long as there's a network of former Azeri that has connected with North Caucasian somewhere in Syria. But this, we didn't see as many as we think because the contingent on Azerbaijan was not as impressive as we were thinking. Okay, yes, please. Uh, Bill Courtney from Rand Corporation. If you're a Russian authority looking at the higher return rates in Europe compared to Russia, is it fairly rational to think that Russia's policy of putting them all in prison is a, an effective policy in terms of reducing the risk to Russia? Alternatively, if Russia were to pursue more liberal policies, de-radicalization and other things, would it take a lot more resources to reduce the level of threat to the level that Russia achieves just by putting them in prison? Certainly in a perfect world, if you can get rid of your FTF or get rid of your radical, and if they never come back, or that you seal the borders strongly enough and control for them not to want to come back because the, they are afraid of the regime. It, yes, it is probably the best approach to do, and Russia is doing extremely well. What we have seen in the past, especially with the example of Saudi Arabia, is that you can maintain long enough this sealed border. Saudi Arabia did it from 88 until 2003, 4 but at, the, at some point, fighters managed to come back and to establish networks. And so to answer your question, yes, I fully agree. Russia so far is the big winner of the Syrian Iraq insurgency because they got rid of their fighters. They made them travel much more easily by giving them passport, helping them. And then they managed even to crack down the Turkish network that was so difficult for them to target for almost 10 or 15 years. So on the short term, Russia managed to destabilize the insurgent networks in Georgia, in Turkey, as well as getting rid of at least 5,000, if not 8,000 individuals that they didn't want inside of their border. What I, I'm telling you is I strongly believe that the blowback effect needs only a couple of hundred people. So even if you can preclude 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 to come back because they're afraid, if 100, 150 seasoned fighters come back, then you'll be in deep trouble in the future. So my prediction, and it's not smart to do prediction in front of the camera, but my, <laughs> my prediction is that Russia will manage to avoid a big backlash for the next five years. And in five to seven years, it will come back at some point, maybe even stronger because those people have connected with Central Asia, with Assyri fighters, with Turkish fighters. And when they will call for jihad in the North Caucasus, call for jihad somewhere at the border of Russia, maybe a lot of people will get the call much more easily than in the past. At the same time, I agree with you. When you come back in the North Caucasus, you come back in Russia, you cannot jumpstart an insurgency. It's extremely difficult. You need to rebuild step by step the network, build trust network, connect with people that you know, get weapons, get organized, get recruitment of people that you trust. All of that takes several years. If you think about 2006 when the Chechen network was most likely destroyed by Saif, Sadulayev, and others, at that point it took roughly three to four years to rebuild a network that was already strong enough. If you think that now the network is completely eradicated, to rebuild a strong network will take five to ten years, probably, 
to the level we have seen in 2011, 2012. So in five, 10 years, Russia will repeat the same thing. Our policy worked, we exported them, we killed them in Syria, we blocked the borders, we target them abroad in Turkey or in Ukraine, but there's a strong risk that they will come back, unfortunately. And I, I still need to see a case where when your foreign fighters goes abroad, they don't come stronger at some point in your history. Thank you. Uh, yes, second row. Thanks. Wendy Silverman, Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor at State. Uh, just to follow up on what you just said, can you elaborate on what you think the international community, uh, as well as these sanctuary countries, um, ought to be doing in order to actually try to mitigate this whole problem? And in addition to that, can you also say a little bit more about Georgia and why, I mean, you, you've, you've, <coughs> you've You've highlighted that a number of foreign fighters are going to Ukraine, while also noting that some have gone to Georgia. Um, and you've said that it was not surprising that Chetayev moved to Georgia versus Ukraine. So can you just sort of flesh out Ukraine, uh, sorry, Georgia? Okay. A bit. I think one thing that needs to be done is to be able first to control at borders when people will be expelled from Turkey, help Ukraine to identify potential fighters because especially Russia and Ukraine are not collaborating as much as they should in terms of identifying foreign fighters. The collaboration between the SBU and the FSB is extremely limited. So all the data about the biometrics or things that people left are not shared between them. They are shared with Georgia with given advantage. Uh, so there is to support financially and logistically security services to be able to control people. At the same time, if there's network of fake Tajik or Ukrainian passport, uh, Ukraine will need to step up their activities to identify those fighters based on biometrics elements. The EU is convinced that they can control at their border the biometrics of fighters, uh, but Ukraine cannot. So if Ukraine cannot, that means that more and more fighters will go toward Ukraine. So in terms of building resilience, it's helping the Ukrainian state to step up into the 21st century in terms of corruption, in terms of reforms, judicial reforms, as well as security services reforms. For Georgia, there will be, we already seen that Chetayev was able to go through the border between Turkey and Georgia, that the border is not as sealed as many actors have been saying. So there is a, a need to support Georgia to better protect their border in the near future, as well as being able to do uh, preventive CV activities in the Panky Sea, as well in Najera. Uh, one example is the counter-terrorist operation that was done in the Panky Sea was a disaster. The, yes, it eliminate a terrorist network, it eliminate people that were connected to Chataev. We don't know if it's true or not, but the way it was done, it's enough to jumpstart support from the local population toward the fighters and the insurgents rather than uh, the Georgian state in general. So in both cases, the EU or the Security Council of the UN has to support countries that will become sanctuaries, whether it is Egypt, Afghanistan, Georgia, or Ukraine. It is important to believe that the foreign fighters problem is global. It's not something that, as long as you don't get to your borders, it, we avoided it. No, it's something that, as long as foreign fighters circulate, they will cause problems somewhere. Think about foreign fighters that went to Tajikistan when the civil war was done. They moved to Chechnya, they moved to Bosnia, they returned to Iraq, they returned to Afghanistan. Those people will move to Jihad Front to Jihad Front until they are stuck, control, or eliminate. So the question is, let's not wait that they come to your border. Let's not wait that they enter your terrorist network at home. But <coughs> preventive strikes or support for sanctuaries are extremely important. And it will be part of PV, CV strategies in the long run. And as much as we will hear the same thing, the same narrative will appear. Oh, there's no major attack since uh, Brussels, since Turkey. Yes, it is. 
but it's when you're faced with a major attack that you say we missed the ball, we missed the opportunity. And it was exactly that uh, with France and Belgium. We believe, oh, they will not enter in the flow of refugees. We don't really care, it will not happen until it's right in front of you. And the Islamic State has been planning this strategy of spillover for the last three years. They were expecting to lose in Raqqa. They were expecting that all forces were coming and they were able to build network outside of Syria and Iraq where they can command those networks. All right, well, this has been a fascinating discussion, but with apologies to people who had remaining questions. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, maybe you can catch the speaker very briefly after yes. the session, but uh, please join me in the thanking Jeff.